Okay, hi everyone. So we're very happy to have Alexander Chankel from University of Nottingham, who is going to tell us about quantum field theories on Lorentzian manifolds. Alex. Yeah, thanks a lot and thanks to Hisham Minouz for the invitation and for this nice conference here. So um, I would like to speak about some kind of research program I'm now following up since a few years on. So it's to study higher categorical structures in quantum field theories that are defined on Lorentzian manifolds. So you might ask why the heck do I want to do Lorentzian manifolds? That is some kind of, yeah, it, it is rooted in physics because Lorentzian manifolds are those types of manifolds which describe gravitation. And they are also quite special, so they have very different features than Riemannian manifolds, and so also uh, quantum field theories that are defined on Lorentzian manifolds will have very different features to the other types of quantum field theories you probably know better about. So, in a way, you should think of quantum field theories that are defined on Lorentzian manifolds as hyperbolic, or as quantizations of hyperbolic partial differential equations, while Riemannian quantum field theories are more like elliptic partial differential equations. And this similarity we will see in a few occasions now. Okay, so um, this is all based on joint work with Marco Benini and a bunch of other people, which I all listed here. And the aim of this talk is to give you a broad overview of this kind of research program and to skip as many details as possible. So in case you have questions about details, ask them to me. I put it here the whiteboard where I can explain details if necessary. Okay, so since I don't expect all of you to be familiar with Lorentzian geometry, I want to review a few aspects of that. So when I say space-time, I always mean a specific type of Lorentzian manifold, namely so maybe I should start with Lorentzian manifold. What is that? So it is a manifold, it has a metric, but the metric is quite funny in the sense that one of its eigenvalues is negative and the other ones are positive. So there's some kind of one special direction which behaves kind of weirdly, and this is called the time direction, which I always draw from going down to going up. So Lorentzian manifolds are manifolds with metric that are special in this case, in this sense. Now, what I mean by globally hyperbolic Lorentzian manifold is that these types of manifolds come with, they exist specific co-dimension one surfaces that are called Cauchy surfaces. And they have the property that when I take causal curves, so curves whose tangent vector is either um, pointing in the time direction or in the null directions, causal curves must hit this surface when they're inextensible. So this is kind of, when you know a bit about PDE theory, this is where you would put your initial conditions on, on such surfaces. And oriented and time-oriented are, I think, self-explanatory. When I talk about space-time embedding, I always mean an embedding of manifolds that preserves all the structures around. So it preserves the orientations, it preserves the time orientations, it preserves the metric, and its image is kind of special again it, in the sense that it uh, preserves the causal structure of the Lorentzian manifold. So image should be causally convex, which means that as I draw here, it shouldn't be a banana where you can go out and in with a causal curve. So a causal curve that starts and ends in the image M stays in there for all times. Okay, so this is a very brief introduction to Lorentzian geometry. And now having identified the relevant space times and space time embeddings we, are, you, we talk about, I package them into a category which for kind of traditional reasons people call log m. Log, is, log m is the category of m-dimensional space times and space time embeddings in this sense. Now, as a consequence of the Lorentzian geometry, you have some distinguished tuples of morphisms in this category, which will play an important role when thinking about quantum field theories and the algebraic structures encoding quantum field theories. So the first important type of morphism, okay, here, in case you didn't notice, this picture here adapts to the kind of point I'm explaining at the moment. So um, Cauchy morphisms are morphisms in this category, so space-time embeddings, which have the property that the image of M considered as a submanifold of N, contains a Cauchy surface of the big space-time. So these are, you should think of them as, as kind of, has the same spatial part as the big space-time, but just a smaller time interval. So you have smaller time in M than in N. And these Cauchy morphisms, yeah, this is just the name we give them, Cauchy morphisms. 
Okay, then another kind of distinguished class of maps or pairs of maps is when you take two maps to the same target N, coming from two different sources, M1, M2, what can happen now is that the images, they don't communicate to each other in the following sense. When you say take M1 and you send out the future and past causal curves from there, that these light cones here, these are called light cones, that they don't intersect M2. So when this happens, I call M1 and M2 causally disjoint, and I denote it by this perp symbol. Okay, then time-ordered uh, tuple is now something which you can define for a tuple of morphisms to a common target. <clears throat> now what time-ordered tuple means is, is indicated here in these pictures. So out of each image, I can send out the future light cone. And time ordered means that the future light cone of M1 doesn't intersect M2. Here, written in formulas like that. The future light cone of M2 doesn't intersect M3. So there's some kind of natural ordering in time, who happens later than who happens earlier. And then time orderable, I mean when I have a tuple, which when I permute, the indices can be brought into a time ordered form. So these are some kind of intrinsically Lorentzian structures, which, we, which will show up when we discuss quantum field theories. Okay. Now, having understood now roughly what is the background on, of Lorentzian manifolds, what we are working on, um, what should a quantum field theory assign to such gadgets, and what should be the relevant properties they, these structures have to satisfy? So in the approach I'm taking, and I'm kind of inspired by, is called algebraic quantum field theory, which is a relatively old approach. It, it I think, goes back to the 60s. It um, was initiated by Harkastler, then further developed by many people. And then in 2003, there was a kind of upgrade of this Harkastler framework to generic Lorentzian manifolds. This was due to Brunetti, Friedenhagen, and Ferch. And algebraic quantum field theories are certain algebraic structures defined on Lorentzian manifolds. Um, and these algebraic structures, they take values in some target category, which I keep now unspecified for the moment. So think of vector spaces, for example, or chain complexes. So T is some symmetric monoidal category. The target category can be also be an infinity category. So now what is this assignment and what are the rules? So in algebraic quantum field theory, you want to assign to each Lorentzian manifold, to each spacetime n, you want to assign an algebra, an algebra in this target category. And this algebra you think of as the algebra of, of operators or observables you can measure in that spacetime. So the quantum field theory should tell you what you can measure in this particular spacetime. A n is the algebra. Now, if you have a spacetime and the tuple of causally disjoint embeddings, M1 to Mn, so there are no causal curves between them. What the quantum field theory also should tell you is how to take observables you can make in these space-like separated regions, which are not talking to each other, and build an observable in the big space-time N out of that. So what you want is some kind of composition map taking from the tensor product of these small algebras, AMI, to the big algebra AN. And this is kind of another type of product. It composes systems that are space-like separated. This is an additional product on top of the product you anyhow have in the local algebras you assign. Now, out of the existence of these two products and that they are compatible, you can conclude something quite nicely. Namely, how typically these, these algebraic quantum field theories are formulated is that people tell you that at space-like separation, you want to have commuting algebra elements. But now when I define it in this way, commutativity at space-like separation is some kind of Ekman-Hilton argument, because these products are compatible with these products, so they must be commutative. So commutativity at space-like separation is a consequence out of these structures. Now, of course, the quantum field theories we are interested in, they should mimic some kind of features from um, hyperbolic PDE theory in the sense that we want to have something like a time evolution for them. And the concept of time evolution in this language is that yeah, you remember what we call Cauchy morphisms, so embeddings which are sufficiently wide that you hit a Cauchy surface of the big space time, and to those morphisms you want to assign equivalences of algebras. 
And through these equivalences, you get a concept of time evolution. You can start from a small time interval and go to a bigger one. And you can match the observables following these equivalences. OK, so that's essentially the structure. Pardon? Um, now this depends. So when you work, say, with normal algebra, say, it would take isomorphisms. And, and this would be equivalent. <coughs> when I work with chain complexes, it would be quasi-isomorphisms. Um, Morita equivalences, I think, um, I, I might comment on that later on the last slide. Okay, so, so these are essentially the rules. And these rules, you can nicely package them into an operat. So this operat has a lot of colors. The colors of the operat are all the space times. And the operations are kind of two different types of operations. So this operat we, we call O, lock, and it depends on what causally disjoint means, so on this perp. So on who are the causally disjoint pairs. Um, now, the, you see that this operat naturally comes from two different types of operations, the object-wise unital associative algebra structures, and these kind of composition operations, which are quite similar to factorization algebra products, but just for very specific types of regions. So this operat here is a kind of bodman fock tensor product of a factorization algebra type operat and of a unital associative operat. And because of the time slice axiom, you have to localize this operat. And when you are working in a higher category, then you, of course, have to localize that as a higher operat. OK, so this kind of gadget determines the, describes the algebraic structure underlying these algebraic quantum field theories. Yes? Is that definition or an uh, That is an isomorphism because we defined that thing um, in, a, in another way originally. So you can take that as a definition, I would say. So when I now would go back to 2016, when we wrote this paper, I would have put that as a definition. But it took me some time to understand that. Yeah. OK, so read that as a definition, I would say. Yeah. And it also matches here these pictures better, I would say. OK. Now you might ask, OK, so well, yeah, so you have a bunch of geometries, a bunch of algebraic structures. Can you say anything about? low dimensions and how these gadgets look like in low dimensions. And we can, yes, and for simplicity, let's for the moment assume that the target is a symmetric monoidal one category. And then, of course, issues about higher categorical localizations of these operats are not present, so you can do normal localizations of these operats. And then you can prove something quite nice, which we proved in this first paper on that subject with Voik and Benini that when you take this AQFT operat, I'm now going a bit more generally. Instead of a space-time category and the concept of causally disjoint pairs, I take any category together with a specification of which we call an orthogonality relation. So this is, you take any category, and in this category, you now, oops, it's not so easy to write on. You select a special class of maps to the same target, which you call orthogonal. And you should think of them as that these two, it, de it defines some kind of independence of subsystems, these orthogonal categories. And um, what you can show is that this operat is so nice that when you localize that as an operat at the class of maps, you can also localize the category, change this orthogonality relation, kind of push it forward along the localization functor of the category. And then you can describe this localized operat as one of the same types of operats, but on a localized orthogonal category. And that is very useful, because working out these localizations of categories is much easier than working them out for operats. And this you can now use in low dimensions, together with a bit of knowledge how Lorentzian geometry works in low dimensions, to give some classification of these AQFTs in low dimensions. So let's start with the lowest dimension. When we are in one dimension, we have one-dimensional space-times, which are something like just timelines. And they have some geometry on them, so some concept of length. Now, localizing at Cauchy morphisms, which are the embeddings of small time intervals into big time intervals, you, of course, can always go to the biggest time interval, so to the whole real line. So when you localize this category, you just have one object left, namely the whole real line. And this whole real line has automorphisms. And these are R, they are translations, 
time translations. So you can show, working out the localization, that the one-dimensional AQFT is the same thing as an algebra together with an R action. But this is something we know also in other contexts. This is when you enjoy the quantum mechanics lecture, this is what they would have told you, that the one-dimensional quantum field theory, which is like quantum mechanics, is about algebras with time evolutions. Now it gets more interesting when you go one dimension up, but to kind of make all that thing feasible, work with conformal, uh, so with, with Lorentz and manifolds, but the morphisms are not supposed to be isometric, but just preserve the conformal structure. So this kind of reduces the number of non-isomorphic objects, and you see, aha, you just have two objects in the localized category, the flat Minkowski space-time and the flat cylinder. And these two objects, yeah, the quantum field theory assigns algebras to them, and the remaining morphisms in these localized categories are familiar from other approaches to CFT, isn't it? Because on the cylinder, I have different morphisms of S1, two copies of that. These are like transformations on the light rays. On the Minkowski space-time, similarly, I, can, I don't have to take diffuse. I can take part of the light ray and embed it in bigger part of the light ray. And then I also have the conformal embeddings from Minkowski to cylinder. So also two-dimensional conformal AQFTs are pretty easy, two algebras with a bunch of group and monoid actions on them, and connected through embeddings of Minkowski into cylinder. OK, um, now unfortunately, these simple tricks don't generalize so easily to higher dimensions. And I will give you some speculations later what I think happens in higher dimensions, but I'm not 100% sure about. OK, so we now see that at least when the target is in one category and the dimension is low, these things become quite tractable and quite familiar. Um, now, what happens when the target is not a one category? So the typical targets we're interested in are chain complexes, so where the field, uh, over a field of characteristic zero. Now, when you work with chain complexes, there are two different variants of this time slice axiom. Let me go back. So you have a strict kind of time slice axiom where you want to have isomorphisms between differential graded algebras, which is, of course, not a nice thing, but you can do that if you want. And you can also assume that to a Cauchy morphism, you assign a weak equivalence of differential graded algebras, which is a kind of a nicer thing. Isomorphisms is easier to work with. Weak equivalences are more natural. So is there some kind of relationship between those two? And yes, there is. You can prove that um, under some assumptions, you can strictify this weak time slice axiom. And how does that work? So when I consider AQFTs that are valued in chain complexes, I can define two different model categories, which capture two different versions of the time slice axiom. The strict time slice axiom, I do as follows. I take the operat encoding AQFTs. I localize the category I'm working on at the maps I want to invert push forward the orthogonality relation, take algebras in complexes, and then this is a category which has a standard model structure, projective model structure on operat algebras. So this model category encodes AQFT satisfying the strict time slice axiom, because I hard-coded it in the underlying category. Now, the weak time slice axiom or homotopy time slice axiom, you have to describe differently. You have to take the operat, think of it as a DG operat, for example, do a homotopic localization of it, and then take algebras in complexes. So this is way more complicated. But then Victor Carmona, who's a quite smart guy, he uh, figured out how to relate this complicated thing, like, uh, like homotopic localizations of operas, to left Bausfield localizations of these algebra categories. So you can you don't have to work out some complicated homotopic localization of operats, but you can work with the old projective model structure and left Bausfield localize it at a suitable type of maps, class of maps, which you can explicitly write down. So this, this here denotes a Quillen equivalence. So the question is then, can one compare these two model categories, the projective one on the localized category and the Bausfield localized model category here? And indeed, you can, and this is some joint work I wrote with Benini and Carmona. We showed that they, you have a functor connecting these two, because you can take the usual localization functor. And this usual localization functor determines a, a Quillen adjunction. This is pullback along that functor, and this is left Kahn extension. 
So this Quillnet junction you, you always have, and you can show that if it turns out that this localization factor, which by construction here, this preserves the orthogonality relation. So who is independent in C stays independent after it is mapped. This is by construction of that thing. If that localization functor has a reflector, so a fully faithful rider joint, that also preserves these orthogonality relations, then you can prove that this is a Quillen equivalence. So under some hypothesis that the localization is nice enough, um, you, you prove that there is an equivalence between the weak, the weak and the strict time slice axiom. Now, in which cases is this localization nice enough? So the examples I told you before, the one-dimensional ones and the conformal two-dimensional ones, these are reflective orthogonal localizations, so the strictification result here applies to them. And also when you take theories that are defined inside a fixed manifold, so this in these slice categories, you pick your favorite space-time, call it universe, and take the slice of all the other space-time sitting in your big space-time, then it also works. Then this, this, the localization of that thing at Cauchy morphisms is also reflective. Okay, now those of you who are familiar with factorization homology and related things, they might say, hmm, it's a bit strange, because what happens in topological quantum field theories is very different. There you also do these kind of localizations, where you localize there at is, is not just Cauchy morphisms, but at isotopy equivalences. And then if you do these localizations, there is no strictification theorem, because when you do these games in higher dimensions, you get EM algebras, which are homologically non-trivial, and you, you cannot strictify an EM algebra. It's a, it's a really homological thing. Um, yeah, so this behavior here is very different to the topological field theories because we also have in special cases of higher dimensions um, strictification theorems. But where this comes from is because um, isotopy equivalences, you can, you can move around much more because when you have some disks and you can move them around and this is how you pick up your higher homotopical data. While in a Lorentzian manifold, you cannot do much. You have such a such a guy, and what you can do through Cauchy morphisms is you can flatten and extend it a bit. So it's some kind of one-dimensional phenomenon which is closer to the one-dimensional factorization algebra, so to the E1 algebras, and these E1 algebras also can be strictified. So, so um, yeah, this is a phenomenon of this type, that time evolution is one-dimensional in a Lorentzian manifold. Okay, now, now we know a bit about low dimensional examples, a bit about formal features. So you might now ask, can one also construct examples in generic dimensions, at least simple ones and stupid ones? Yes, one can. They are a bit stupid. So physically speaking, these are field theories which are free. They, are not, they don't have self-interactions. But these you can construct nicely in this framework. So where you start from is you start from essentially the same data as costello Williams start when they construct factorization algebras. You start from a so-called from so-called free BV theories, and I also want to have a natural collection of those, one of them for each manifold, for each space-time. So what is a free BV theory? This is a complex of differential operators. So these are complexes of sections of some vector bundles. They encode the fields. And the differential operators, they encode stuff like the equation of motion, the gauge symmetries, etc. So all the dynamics and gauge theory aspects and so on of these theories is encoded in this complex. And then this complex here is equipped with a minus 1 shifted symplectic structure, which is some kind of remnant of a classical action functional. OK, so we start from here, the same starting point as costello William, And then if we assume something, which is, again, a very Lorentzian phenomenon, namely some kind of existence of Green's functions. Existence of Green's functions, they are two different ones in a Lorentzian signature. So if you study Green's functions for the wave equation, you see that there are two different ones. When this is your source, you can either propagate it forward there's a kind of G plus, a retarded Green's function, or you can also propagate it backward in time. There's a G minus. So there are always two, the forward and the backward Green's function. And you can 
that is something I find quite crazy. I mean, I, I didn't expect that this goes so nicely. This concept of green functions, it has a kind of homological meaning, which you can make sense of in this free BV theory. So how does that look like? So um, when I want to have a homological analog of Green's functions, what do I want to do? I want to take something which is compactly supported in some region, and I want to propagate it, say, to the future of this region. So I'm talking about maps. This bracket here is internal home. Maps from K, stuff supported in K, to stuff supported in the future of K, say. And there is one specific map, namely you can take sections supported in K and think of them as sections supported in the bigger set, namely future of K. And this inclusion map, when this admits a homotopy to zero, then these homotopies play the same role as Green's functions in ordinary PDE theory. That's quite funny. Um, and yeah, it's, it's quite cool. So you can define a concept of Green's functions or Green's operators or Green's homotopies in such chain, chain complex language. You can prove a variety of results. You can prove a uniqueness theorem. You show that the space of such Green's operators is contractible when it's non-empty. So they behave in many ways how ordinary Green's functions behave. And if you have, if you assume existence of these guys, then you can show that from a free BV theory a la costello Guillem, and these Lorentzian extra data, namely the Green's functions, you can produce an AQFT out of this data. And this AQFT satisfies the time size axiom in the weak version and is nice. Okay, so as an example, let me show you how that works in an example. Um, <clears throat> so when I take linear Young Mills, so the, the linear part of Young Mills theory, I'm talking about this complex here. So here, these are the degrees, 0, 1, 2, minus 1. Stuff in degree 0 are one form, so connections, abelian connections. Then this is the Maxwell equation. D is the Durand differential. Delta is Hodge star D Hodge star. So this is the Maxwell equation. This is the code differential encoding the undi field part. And this is the differential encoding the gauge symmetry part. So this complex here tells you about dynamics, undi fields, and, and um, gauge symmetries of the Maxwell theory. Now, we can look at this complex with supporting K in a compact region or in the future and past of K. We have these inclusion maps. And now, if you introduce some auxiliary operator, namely, we can always define this D'Alembertian operator, which is the Lorentzian version of the, the Lorentzian version of the Laplacian. This guy has Green's functions. This you can prove. Um, and when you take these Green's functions of the, the D'Alembertian and you modify them here in the other degrees with d and delta, you see that you get a Green's homotopy. Now, this choice of Green's homotopy in the contractible space of all Green's homotopies, this kind of choice is something which I think people traditionally call a gauge fixing, because I have to make a choice which point I pick in this contractible space, and that corresponds to something like a gauge fixing. So here, this is like Lorentz gauge, or what people call Lorentz gauge. OK, so that works pretty fine. Now you might ask, okay, so this is all a bit exotic and there was never really much interplay between AQFT and topologists and other people. So, so you might now ask, so, so it, does this ancient AQFT technology have something to do with less ancient factorization algebra and functorial field theory technology? So is there some relationship between AQFTs and factorization algebras? a la costello -Guillem. And indeed, you can do that. You can tweak the definition of factorization algebra a bit in order to define it on Lorentzian manifolds. This is what we call time-orderable prefactorization algebras. I'll show you the pictures in a second. And then you can prove some comparison theorem. So how does that work? What is a time-orderable prefactorization algebra? It does something pretty similar to what a factorization algebra does. To each manifold or to each space-time, in our case, it assigns just an object in your target category, not an algebra. You have less object-wise products. So the factorization algebra is different in the sense that I don't multiply on the same M. There is no product of this type. However, I have more factorization type products because I can not only multiply things which are causally disjoint, but I can multiply regions or tuples of regions which are 
time orderable. And this is here an example. M3 here, this is the latest, then M1 is the next, and M2 is the next, or M3, M2, M1. This is another time ordering. These are not unique, but this is compatible. Um, so here, when I have a picture like that of time orderable regions, I can multiply on that object I assign. And these are, in physics terminology, like the time ordered products. Um, or well, these are the factorization products of Costello Quilliam, but for time ordered regions. Now, with some Lorentzian geometry, you can show that the operat encoding these kind of gadgets maps into the AQFT operat I was talking about before. So you have a map of operats, hence you can definitely go backwards. You can take an AQFT and pull it back along this map of operats and produce a factorization algebra. So this functor here you have always, from AQFT, pull it back to a factorization algebra, time orderable prefactorization algebra. What is now mysterious is when you localize, so you take things satisfying time slice axiom on both sides, the AQFT and the factorization algebra, when they both satisfy time size axiom and the mild condition, which we call additivity, which kind of tells you that there are no observables at infinity. So what additivity means is that what you assign to a space time, you can recover by taking a co-limit over pre-compact regions. So there's nothing hidden here in these corners. Um, when you have these two extra conditions, then you can prove that you have an equivalence of categories. So for all practical purposes, where you have both of these things, AQFTs and factorization algebras are equivalent in this way. And this is, for the moment, I, I forgot to say, this just works at the moment in the one category. And this is partly due to my lack of technology in higher categories. So the proof we, the proof we write down for that. So we, we construct this left adjoint or the, the, the inverse of the equivalence explicitly. I mean, we construct out of these data object-wise products. This requires some choices. We have to invert some maps. Now, when working in a higher category, you cannot strictly invert. You have to have multiple types of inverses, but it's still a contractible space, but I cannot do my arguments anymore to, to prove that in a higher category. I think it will be true in a higher category. It's just my lack of technology, which uh, doesn't allow me to do so. But when you work with the target category of chain complexes, which is the most relevant one for applications, then there are also some example-based comparisons, of, for example, by William Reisner and by Benini, Musanda, and myself, where you show that even at the level of examples and at the level of quantization constructions, these two frameworks match, kind of. OK. Now, more speculative. Um, I. I, I typically don't do much bordisms, but I think since the conference is called something bordisms, I have to say at least a bit about it. Um, so how, how does this AQFT things relate to functorial field theories, a la Stolz, Teichner, and others? So first of all, since you are working with globally hyperbolic, since we are working with globally hyperbolic Lorentzian manifolds, they are always of this form, R times sigma. One can show that as manifolds, they're always R times sigma. So, if you now want to have bordisms from a Cauchy surface to another one, they're always cylinders. So topologically, they're not hard. But they have a lot of geometry on them. So the bordisms appearing in global hyperbolic Lorentzian geometry are cylinders with a rich geometry. Now, what I think, but what I still cannot prove fully, is the following. When I forget about the morphisms which are not Cauchy morphisms. So I'm just looking at morphisms of this type, where one, the smaller guy, maps into the bigger guy in a sufficiently wide way. When I restrict to this subcategory, given by all space times, but just Cauchy morphisms, I think that when I localize it, and I think this localization I can work out because there is a calculus of fractions, so you can work that out if you want. This localization is, I think, equivalent to a Stolz-Teichner type bordism category for globally hyperbolic Lorentzian manifold. So there are some indications that this works. I showed it in a moment. However, where of course the bordisms, because they describe time evolution, should be invertible. So you localize this category at all bordisms. So um, what does that mean? Is that every algebraic quantum field theory of the type I introduced, when you restrict it to these special types of morphisms, 
then it captures a representation of the Lorentzian bodies. And, and this is what encodes the time evolution, just the time evolution, but forgets about spatial locality aspects that you can go like space like far apart. So this is not encoded in that picture. So you can show that all of that is true in the simplest case in one dimension. This is what I'm doing at the moment with my student McManus and Severin Bunk. And we are also trying to do that also in higher dimensions and to show that this works. Now the open problem is of course in making that work, in comparing this AQFT picture to the Stolz-Steichner bordism picture, um, <clears throat> we, are, we are losing some structure, namely all this spatial locality coming from the additional morphisms we throw away in making this comparison. And then it's of course the question which kind of additional structure on the functorial field theory side do you get from this spatial locality structure on the AQFT side? Yep. So about the open, op about the open question, you mentioned that the algebras you get of local observables, they're at best, they're sort of like E1 algebras, right? You don't get higher structure. So where would you, I mean, you're not seeing anything higher, you're just seeing E1 algebras. So where would yeah. you expect this higher categorical structure to be living? Which, I, uh, which one? This one or which no, one? E even if you expect like an extended field theory, then you should expect something yeah. which wants to generate a higher category. I'm not even sure if I expect it. That's why oh. I'm putting a question mark. So I, I, I really don't know. I mean, there's another option. I will think, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, I'm probably sure that these, that these extended field series, how they are typically done, this, this is not what works in this Lorentzian situation. It's something different. I, the feeling I have is that this extra structure is some kind of, on each Cauchy surface, you have, in, you have a factorization algebra structure at the fixed time. Yeah? So you have additional products on each Cauchy surface, and then you have bordisms giving you the time evolution. It's some kind of structure where equal time factorization products and bordisms mix, and I'm not sure which kind of structure that is. Yeah, I, I suppose the physicists can answer this question because they talk about like sort of higher categorical structure on Lorentzian space-time. So maybe they can answer this question. Uh, who? Physicists. I mean, they talk about defects and on Lorentzian space-time. Okay. So what do they mean by that? <laughs> I I'm not so sure. <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So. The, 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 How do you define physicist? Well, people who work with Lorentzian space-time. My definition is people who talk about field theories of Lorentzian space time. What names, like what names. papers do you have in mind? Well, people, we, we have people over here in the audience where you talk about. No, sorry, I have nothing to say. No, <laughs> <laughs> there, I could name several physicists, but I don't know if that really helps. I'm saying that people who talk about like, quantum field theories on Lorentzian space time talk about. Okay. Uh, the kind of people I talk about who do Lorentzian spacetimes, they, they already struggle to understand what happens when I put a, space, uh, a time like boundary in the game and to understand. Because it's, it, it gets like really sophisticated because you have like non trivial PDE problems and then boundaries and then gauge symmetries and higher categories. So it's a mix of so many different things that. that uh, we, I think the people I know, they don't know, and, and I don't know. And yeah, I agree. I agree. What what happens here, and how is that structure somehow encoded? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Then um, yeah. So this was the the Vegas slide. Um, but I yeah. I this we just started doing quite recently, and I hope that I have in when Hijam organizes in three years' time again that I can tell you the full story. I don't know. Um, so another future direction which I'm interested in, and this is not as vague, but because there we already have done some stuff, is um, so the types of AQFTs we, I would talked about for most of the talk, they are what I would call affine. Affine in the following sense, because from the beginning I said what you should assign 
is some unitless associative algebra or a DG algebra when you are in a gauge theoretic context. How do you think about these DG algebra? So these are observables, these are functions on my moduli space of fields. But now interesting fields have not normal moduli spaces, they have like derived stacks as moduli spaces. Now how I think of this AM is some kind of function algebra on a derived stack and then I quantize it suitably. Now there's a bit of a red flag going on here because the mo uh, m most of the derived stacks you find in nature, they do, they, they are not, they, they have very stupid function algebras. They are not faithfully encoded by their function algebra. So most derived stacks are never affine, at least the interesting ones. So you don't have to go very far to find an interesting derived stack or even a normal, not even derived stack that has a stupid function algebra. Then you take the classifying stack for some reductive affine group scheme. You look at its function DG algebra. So by function DG algebra, I mean the one, the one which is defined by the following rule. So on the, on the affines, I assign A. And on a generic guy, I write it as a co-limit over affines. And to that I assign the limit of this diagram over A. Yeah? So, so this is the way what I mean by function algebra. And this limit takes place in the, in the category of CDGAs. Um, so these function algebras, when you play these games for quotient stack, in particular that one, you see, oh, it's just group cohomology. But now I assume the reductive group, so all the higher group cohomologies are gone. So the function algebra of this BG and the function algebra of the point is the same. So it's like it doesn't, my function algebras don't see anything about the gauge symmetries, totally forget them. Now there is a smarter way to do so, and this is, uh, I, I think, going back to uh, Kalak, Pandev, Toen, Vaki, Vetsosi, derived algebraic geometry. There they thought about you have funny derived stacks and you want to quantize them, but you don't have function algebras. How do you do that? Ah, okay. Instead of taking functions, you take something like vector bundles on your moduli stack. So these are quasi-coherent modules. So these quasi-coherent modules, they form a symmetric monoidal DG category. And now you can quantize that. And as which kind of monoidal category you quantize, that depends a bit on the shift of your Poisson structure. The Poisson structures can have cohomological shifts. In field theory, in the type of field theory I'm speaking about, in the Lorentzian ones, you have an unshifted Poisson structure. So you would expect that this thing here gives you an E0 monoidal DG category, so it's a DG category with a specific point. Now, these kind of things are better because you can, in many cases, reconstruct your moduli stack from these quasi coherent chief categories. So this is a better framework where you don't have these issues. And that kind of motivates to do the following. When you remember that the AQFT operat is some kind of factorization algebra like operat for causal disjointness and the unital associative operat, why not absorbing the unital associative in the target category and then say, okay, why not looking at the G categories together with these multiplications from coming from space-like separated regions. And this is what I would call a non-affine AQFT. So it's a DG category valued algebra over this factor of the AQFT operator because I split it off the pointwise multiplications. And this we studied in a simpler two categorical context where we work with locally presentable categories instead of with DG categories where you can easier work. And that behaves quite nicely. So you have nice embeddings of normal AQFTs into the, the non-affine ones and truncation construction, etc. You can also discuss some examples of, for example, sigma models with, uh, with values in orbifolds. So you can play some games, construct simple ones in that language and see how that phenomena work. Or you can also go a bit wilder and go to a spatial hypersurface, approximate it by a lattice and then also do some, some derived version of non-abelian lattice and mill theory. You can also construct that in that language and define something like that, where the category now is just the, the regions of the Cauchy surface. So it's a kind of lattice approximation like thing. This was in, done in a paper with Benini and Britham. Okay, uh, I think I'm done, and I hope I didn't go too much over time. Great, thank you very much. Alexander. Further questions for Alexander?
So, um, hi. 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 Uh, in AQFT, um, the observable algebras are um, usually C star algebras. So, yep. is there any way to get this analysis involved into your setting? Good question. Uh, C star and DG, they don't like each other. Um, I think the, uh, in this non-defined picture, I think so. Because, I mean, I'm not 100% sure. So, so you can get some version of analysis in the game. So um, I think when you take a target category, but there are two choices. Either you say take complete bonological spaces, then you do some type of analysis, which is fine and it works because the category of complete bonological spaces is good enough to allow me to do what I want. Or you can take something else when you are forgetting for the moment the DG part. There is something which is called operator spaces, which are like funky versions of Banach spaces, which also forms a nice category. And you can play these games in there. And then you get pretty close to C-star algebras, but not fully. So, so uh, C-star algebras for Neumann algebras, I have no idea how, how to do a, a, the higher categorical story. I mean, the one categorical story, of course, this works with C-star for Neumann, but the higher categorical story, I don't know. OK, good, Sergey. <clears throat> uh, what, what happened to uh, minus one shifted symplectic structure in AQFT? What, what ah. role does it play? Ah, OK, good point. Um, so the, the, the role is, so it, get, it, gets, it gets shifted via some kind of Poisson additivity-like feature. And how you see that in, in explicit formulas is that the omega minus 1, you can write as del of something. And this something comes from the Green's, uh, Green's homotopies. So you can, you can trivialize that guy in two different ways. Okay, now you might say it's, my, it's shifted symplectic, so where's the non-degeneracy? So these things are, in fact, because they look, William called them shifted symplectic, but they're more shifted Poisson. So they can be trivialized. So it's, yeah, we are working with infinite dimensional things, so it's a bit funky what is symplectic. So, so what turns out is that these guys here, they're trivializable, but in two different ways namely in a retarded way, so forward in time, and in, a, and, and in an advanced way, backward in time. Now, if you compare these two types of trivializations, the forward and backward in time, you get the unshifted symplectic structure. So there's a quite explicit way how to trivialize this guy in two different ways, intrinsically Lorentzian ways, and the difference of these trivializations gives you an unshifted symplectic structure. And this kind of trivialization construction also, I don't know if you have seen these formulas that people put like, people write down things like that, that you take retarded minus advanced Green's function, they call it commutator function in physics, and write down things like that for the commutation relation of fields. So for example, when you take two field operators smeared by, by two test functions, then they tell you that i h bar this guy is is the commutation relation. So and this kind of story also tells you where this type of commutator function comes from. Uh, so so you use these green homotopies to trivialize that, and then this gives you at the end this commutation relation. So so yeah, so it gets kind of sh unshifted. Okay, Nito. Uh, no, no, these are... Uh, these what, are only operator algebras, right? Only you cannot a, see this construction of a, a state space. I mean, these, 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 are, these are like module categories at the end. So, right. so, so I'm, 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 I'm deciding not to take one representation. I want to take all of them because there's, right. again, Lorentzian issues that there's no distinguished vacuum state. So, and, and they're all inequivalent representations. So if so many inequivalent representations on a generic Lorentzian manifold, it's better to take all of them and not the... So thing. you're sort of working in the bulk, in some sense. Yeah. You're not working in the boundary. No. This is... I'm never restricting really to code. I mentioned one. I'm always a bit thick. Uh, I understand. Very good. Any other questions? Yes. Um, could you go back one slide, please? Sure. Right, so you have 
you have this equivalence that you want to show, and on the right you're inverting all morphisms, so presumably you get a space. And this is quite similar to what has been done by Galatius, Matson, Tillman, Weiss, where they show that if you invert all morphisms of a bottom category, you get uh, this Matson Tillman spectrum. So I've been wondering if you have explored similar ways of showing that the two spaces are equivalent. Well, okay. Yeah. I, thanks for mentioning that. So I don't know spectra at all, so I'm <laughs> not a topologist. So I'm, yeah, maybe maybe good question. Yeah? So, so you say that this, this uh, Tillman, M, M, the M T yes. The, the usual guy, yeah. okay, the, the, this is, okay, I, I might be have a look into that, because when they proved something like that in other situations, maybe the techniques are useful. Right. Um, so, it, I, I think you said that your um, monoidal structures on, on these categories are not symmetric, is that correct, or are they symmetric? On which ones? Like on maybe... I don't. I don't remember. I just. I just remember you made a point about like things not being e infinity, but ah, this was here. The, the, this is here because after quantization, the the um, yeah. The I see. After quantization, you lose symmetric monoidality, <laughs> so it goes down to a certain less symmetric monoidal. Got it. So what, what I'm getting at is it's important in the uh, in the Masson Tillman. Uh, setting that your bosom categories have a symmetric monoidal structure because that's what will give you the, the commutative monoid structure on spaces which you then show as group like so that you have a spectrum. So uh -huh. if that <laughs> if okay, if okay. I see. So some monoidal structures on here. On, on yeah, one, one then would have to take yeah, not just a single timeline but like disjoint unions of those. So I think monoidal structure you can put in there if you want. Okay. okay. Yeah, thanks. I, I <laughs> will have a look in these things. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Alexander again for the nice talk. <laughs>